under my screen. Oh, sorry about that. I had the... forgotten to start the recording. So, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. So I mean, it was it was a lot to cover, and uh, it, I was kind of said justice and public safety. I don't really have a whole lot of knowledge going into it, and uh, the the expectation was that it, it's usually a fairly quiet portfolio. And then we had uh, Hurricane Dorian hit, with, which was justice and public safety. And then we had a malware attack, uh, which was justice and public safety. And then we had a pandemic, which was justice and public safety. So it became a very busy portfolio when it was supposed to be uh, something that doesn't usually have a whole lot of action happening in it. And then on the other side of things, the transportation infrastructure and energy side of things, I think I'd have to say my experience has been a frustrating one on that side of things because we ended up developing some legislation and bringing it to the floor uh, with all sorts of consultation and input from experts and academics and the government voted it down just 12 to 13 vote and then within two weeks i had a meeting with the department and the minister and the deputy ministers and they said uh, their sustainable communities initiative that they've been trying to get off the ground requires this that and the other thing which was everything that was in my legislation that they voted against so uh, now they're working on developing legislation that does that exact same thing. And uh, well, that's, that's just frustrating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is, is there anything uh, that you've learned from uh, the experience of your, uh, your portfolios over the last couple of years? Nothing is as simple as it seems. That's what I've yeah. learned being in politics here. Even the smallest changes have echo out into other, other acts and impact people's lives and in ways you you may not even consider when you think this is just a simple little change well it might be to some and it might not be to others so it's, it's a very complex thing okay so uh so you're you're now uh you've traded in those portfolios for education and lifelong learning uh first of all are you excited about your new new portfolios oh absolutely i mean i got I got four little ones now, as uh, three of them are currently in the education system. I'm one, uh, one two months old right now, so uh, mm -hmm. up and coming. Uh, baby Harper's on with us here now. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I have all sorts of current experience with the education system and how it's working as far as Elm Street goes in any case. Uh, but mm -hmm. I've been, since I've had this role, I've been talking with uh, parents from across PEI um, and a lot of the concerns that they have and, you know, sadly enough, a lot of their concerns came to light in the incident at East Wiltshire School. There's an mm -hmm. awful lot of discussions about the, the atmosphere within our schools and the problem we have with bullying and things like that. So um, we had already started the, the ball rolling on, on trying to find out ways we might be able to address that. And then East Wiltshire's incident happened and really just kicked that into overdrive here now. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's I guess the big issue that'll be dominating uh, first part of your 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 mandate as uh, education critic, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, what what parts of your your new portfolio in education um, do you feel like you have the most to learn about? The most to learn about this how the the actual education system like on, on the administration side of things actually works. Just as a as a small example, I was. I was wondering why aren't we funding these playgrounds? Elm Street needed a new playground and was having trouble fundraising the money and why isn't government helping? Well, uh, be because of the way it's set up and government doesn't fund any schools playgrounds, which honestly I think is is wrong. I think we, if, if anything, we need more play with our children. We gotta make sure that every school has appropriate playground equipment, but just yeah. things like that, where why isn't this happening? And the education, portfolio is a strange one. For instance, the transportation department buys the school buses, but the education department operates them and hires the drivers and things like that. So there's a lot of shared responsibilities and it's a fairly complex how the it all works on the education side of things. Right. Okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know that there was no uh, government funding for the playgrounds. I mean, you hear about people fund raising funds for playgrounds, but I would have thought that the government would have had some part of that. Well, that is why they have to do the fundraising. Yeah, interesting. And that's expensive, right? Eh? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, education and lifelong learning, uh, you know, we, we obviously know that involves, you know, our school system. Uh, can, you, can you give us a sense of, of the full scope of your portfolio? So, 
I guess the lifelong learning refers to post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. right? That's and, right. Uh, That's right. Else? Yeah. Well, I mean, schools, libraries, Iraq falls yeah. under education just because it mm -hmm. has the least uh, to do with education. So to avoid any sort of conflicts, they house Iraq within education. Uh, it's the minister responsible in any case. And student loans is a big one that uh, education is responsible for. I mean, Department of Finance obviously gives out the dollars, but uh, the student financial services goes through the Department of Education as well. Yeah. Do you uh, do you think that uh, that Iraq is going to be uh, there's going to be some issues there that uh, that you're going to be working on over the next couple of years? Well, it's. You know, it's, it's strange because since Iraq's in education, because it has the least to do with education, it's <laughs> uh, it's probably not me that's going to be dealing with Iraq, even though it's under my portfolio. So things like housing and electricity and energy prices, and all sorts right. of things are regulated by Iraq, but not the education system. So it's, it's a bit of a strange one in that regard. Okay. Okay, um, and I know that, you know, you're obviously really uh, new to their, this portfolio. Um, but I'd be interested to know if there are any ideas that uh, that you're already working on or, or thinking about, you know, directions you'd like to go uh, as far as your work in this area. Mm, yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thing that that, uh, that I, I thought would be a, a good change and, and once again, we started this work and then and then the announcement about the 215 children's bodies that were found. Out in British Columbia came came out and um, but uh, more Mi'kmaq curriculum and culture the history language uh, learning more about the truths of our of our shared history and things like that because I know when I went through the education system it was entirely absent uh, we we had a little project on Mi'kmaq I learned you know settlers arrived everybody got didn't get along then got along and I glued some birch bark to a piece of bristle board and that was that so that's mm. not even close to enough of uh, figuring out our, our shared history and, and acknowledging the truths of some of the horrors that happened as well. So uh, that, that's a big part of what I'd like to accomplish. And uh, we have also noticed that, uh, well, back in 2012, uh, the, there was a motion passed unanimously in the House urging government to consider anti-bullying legislation. And nothing's ever come of it. PEI, I think, is the only province that has no anti-bullying legislation. Um, hmm. in place as of today. So uh, that's something else I think we're going to have to seek to address, particularly in light of East Wiltshire here. Okay, well, those are those are some really great places uh, to begin. So, uh, so now with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, open the floor up to uh, to those of you who've joined us today. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your, your ideas. We want to know um, what issues uh, Steve should be aware of and that you may maybe like would like him to to try to make some headway on uh, in the next two years and um, you know any any tips that you have uh, on in terms of people that uh, Steve should be talking to to learn about any of these issues uh, like I said books or, or anything that you think um, he could get some more information on to, to better understand some of these uh, ideas as well so uh, if you'd like to, uh, to contribute uh, anything here, you can either uh, use the raise hand function. You will find that, depending on your Zoom interface, as I've learned, it, it's different for everybody. Uh, it might be under reactions. If you go to your toolbar, there's reactions, um, same place where you can sort of clap your hands and do thumbs up. There should be a raise hand feature there. Um, that way we'll see you and, and make sure that uh, you get a chance to, to talk. Um, that it might also be, you might also have to go to the dot, dot, dot more, and uh, you might have a, the option there, um, perhaps under participants, you might see raise hand. You can also just chat, type into the chat. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, say hello in the chat so that it's gonna light up for everybody and you can see. Uh, where that's located, and you can you can always just get our attention and say uh, something in the chat. And um, I've created a board here um, that I'm going to share with uh, with all of you. I'm just going to share the link. It's uh, what I call an idea board. And uh, 
you know, I'm going to be taking notes as, as people, uh, you know, add their ideas and tips uh, onto this board, but you can also, um, you can go right into this link and you can, you can add your own. If there, there's anything, you know, just to something quick you want to add or even after this session. Uh, it's at seven o'clock Ottawa time. So it starts later. So, you so, um, so yeah, you can always go, go back into that board after the session if they're like, oh, I forgot to say this. And, uh, and then we'll be passing all of this, these ideas and input on the feed. Um, so uh, is there anybody that, uh, that has any, any ideas or, or issues or anything that you'd like to bring up? Yes. Okay, Bob, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Thank you for doing this. Um, I would suggest that if you want to learn something about the portfolio, particularly the school system, get into schools. Go spend a day at a school if you can, if you know somebody. If you don't, I'm sure some of us could uh, grease some wheels for you. And uh, spend a day in, in different types of schools. Um, talk to teachers, talk to kids talk to uh, everybody at the school, talk to parents. Um, formal structures are great, but the informal structures are even better. Um, and as long as I have the floor, I'll do all four, four 53 of my points here. <laughs> um, that, that's my biggest recommendation, that one. Also, um, it's dangerous to see education as buildings and things and stuff like that. Um, successive governments uh, get really excited about building new schools and uh, putting on wings and putting on classrooms. They're all important for sure. Um, it's, it's the programs and what happens in the schools that are way more important than the shiny new junior high in Stratford, no offense to any of my Stratford friends or anything like that, or the high school or whatever. Um, to, try not to get diverted by that stuff. You know, really focus on, you know, if we're gonna deal with bullying, and that was one of my issues as a school principal and as a district principal, the bullying happens where you don't see it. It happens on social media. It happens in the back of the bus. It happens on the playground around the corner from the teacher. Um, the only way to deal with bullying is to prevent it. And to prevent bullying requires a huge effort to initiate a culture that in which bullying is just anus. And it's just people, kids are offended by bullying. They won't stand and watch. They won't, uh, they won't participate, they won't laugh with the big kid. They'll, they'll be disgusted and walk away. It's, an, it's a really challenging goal. You might never get to that, but getting in that direction is, takes a lot of effort, a lot of programming, a lot of training and a lot of work. And teachers are unbelievably overworked. So adding more things onto teachers doesn't necessarily work. Sometimes you have to take some things away too. But I wish you all the best in this portfolio. I'm ex I was excited to see you uh, uh, take it on. And my last point would be listen to Carla Bernard. She knows what she's talking about. Listening to Carla today. And yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a fair point that, that you make that uh, bullying it's kind of a systemic issue that's built up a culture, as you say, and we, we really have to break the cycle somehow. And that's not going to be easy. I fully acknowledge that. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much for those great contributions, uh, Bob. Um, so I'm going to go over to Adina, who has her hand up here. Adina. Hi, I just wanted to mention, I noticed that during the whole uh, introduction and just speaking about what we know. Um, there was a complete lack of mentioning the early years, uh, which is also part of the portfolio. And it's a fairly important part in my opinion, as we need to get the kids ready for school. So they need to have a positive experience in the early years. Um, it's, 
also like a few things that I want to mention about the early years. And I think one of the things that's bothered me the most for the longest amount of time is, for example, if I have a child with any type of special needs in my program, I can get funding to support that child, but the, the adult who is supporting, the educator who is supporting that child does not require any education at all. Essentially, I can take an 18 year old, put them with an autistic child, even though they've never, even if they've never seen a child, like been around children before, and that's acceptable to the province. That's what they expect. And I think that's really disappointing because the more issues you can resolve in the early years, the more success they will have in school. And I really think that that needs to be t taken a look at. It, it, it's unacceptable that we give such poor service to the children who need it the most. And um, another suggestion that I, I would have for you, and um, I've been uh, taking courses on, on the administration in early years. And one of the things I've noticed is how amazingly well detailed all the laws in Ontario are when it comes to the early years sector. You, you can't go wrong. It tells you exactly what to do and how to do it right in the law. So there's no, there's no gray in between. This is how you do it. And that's the end of the story. So I, I would strongly suggest that you at least take a quick look at those laws, read them over and compare them with the childcare laws that we have on PEI because I believe their laws are absolutely amazing. Um, all, very, all very good points, Adina. And, you know, while we were talking here, I I had my own realization that, whoops, we didn't mention early childhood education. So that's, that is a huge part of it. Problem. I mean, if, if we want to affect systems change, that's where you start. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and then the last thing I guess I would love to say is I know this issue has already been brought up and many people are aware of it. It's, it's a lack of uh, support for the children who need any type of emotional support. There's a lot of uh, help to get them to succeed in school, but if they're not well off emotionally, um, like a youth and child care worker or a counselor in the school, those are very hard to find and very hard to access. Uh, my children all use that, that program through the schooling, but I know that often what happens, for example, with my middle child is he'll have a panic attack in in the middle of the classroom and he ends up sometimes in the washroom, sometimes at my office door because I work in the same building, but that's because he's not able to find that that help within the school to help him deal with these these moments. He tries to go see the counselor, but she she's overworked. I mean, she, she works incredible hours. She gets there usually at 7.30 in the morning and she doesn't leave till usually four, and four or five. And we even had a workshop at the school this Saturday and she was there on Saturday working on a project she was doing for the ch children. That's how much hours she puts just in order to be there for those children. And still not enough. Still not enough, unfortunately. It's, it's one person for kindergarten to grade 12. Hmm. Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adina, for bringing those perspectives uh, and experience from your work in early childhood. Um, we've got a lot of people with their hands up, so that's great. Uh, let's go over to Maria next. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. This is somewhat related to Adina's uh, question. Um, is that, is um, childcare part of your portfolio? Yes. Childcare policy. Yeah. Early childhood education. It, yeah. it, it, that's right, because er, early childhood is closely related to childcare, which I guess it may start before the, part, the educational part. That, yes. And, and, uh, and then I, I'm interested in hearing your views because now the federal government has this uh, budget commitment to a national childcare, and um, then they have to work with the province, right? Be and and what? How do you how do you see a program that it's going to take advantage of this 
this federal budgetary uh, commitment. I, I, I'm very interested in this because I, I my my children went to child. You, they went through their early um, childhood education in Quebec. And I honestly I thought I had won the lottery because if I had ended up coming to Canada in some other province, I could never have survived. This is, this is what saved me, okay? And not only saved me, it, it, I think the, the, the Quebec childcare program, basically it's, it's what, uh, I don't know how to say, it. it's what, uh, it was a key factor of the success of my family, me and my children making a life in Canada, in, a life in Canada. I just have seen how people, what people go through in other provinces, including ours, to, to try to balance their the need for the mother to work, to make a living, their finances, childcare, and all of that kind of stuff. And I didn't suffer through any of that because I was in Quebec. I just had it easy. So how do you see our childcare situation evolve? Because I imagine that people who end up being lucky enough to, to, to uh, find a, a space in Adina's French, uh, early childhood education program, they also think they won the lottery, okay? Because not everybody here has this universal access. What is, what, how, how are we moving in that direction? What do you think the province role is gonna be and what are your, your thoughts about that? It, it, great questions, Maria, but uh, mostly I'm here to, to hear your ideas on, on how we could change things uh, for this session. But I'll tell you, with early childhood education, the, the issue I have heard about in the past, before I was even in this role, uh, is, is the wage exactly. uh, is, it, issue within it. I mean, there these, are the, exactly. these are the folks that, as I mentioned, if we're going to affect systemic change in a generation, that's where we start. Mm -hmm. And we're paying the people who are performing that service for society a pittance uh, by times, certainly not up to snuff with the level of skill required in order to achieve the results we'd like to see. So that, that's about the extent of my knowledge about what needs to be changed in early childhood education at this point. But I would love to hear your thoughts on, uh, you had mentioned the federal budget there, Maria, and uh, I, I must admit, uh, I haven't followed it closely because it hasn't passed yet. And I'd love to I, I just don't have to, I just don't have time on, on maybes. We, we might be in election with no budget passed. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. the, Quebec, the, the Quebec program was simple. It was massive subsidy to parents and that allowed this uh, and, and to the system in general, the injection of money to the system. And that, that indirectly deals with the wage issue because allows the providers to, to get better better pay and better training and better everything it was uh, so so i think that the 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 what is proposed in the federal budget is to provide money to the provinces uh, with a view to be to do something similar uh, maybe more evolved and more modern or something as what the quebec people the quebec government did more than 20 years ago and, and that, I guess there were no, it was not perfect. And some people think that they are, I guess some, I heard some people very critical of that Quebec program. I can't believe, I don't know what, what part of it they were exposed to, but for me, this was just fantastic. And I can't believe that it's taking the rest of Canada so many years, like two decades more to, to, to get to this point where we're now, where there's some hope uh, I guess, um, yeah. And my other interest in education, and I, and and this is this is an idea that I think I, I share with some of you in this meeting already. Uh, and it's another thing that is influenced by my children being raised in Quebec is is curriculum. I find, and that's also a provincial responsibility, like like early childhood education curriculum, and and I find that. For example, as in the Green Party, we one of one of our core values is active citizenship, 
And in, in the school curriculum of Quebec, there is way more emphasis, especially in middle, high school, secondary, secondary yeah, school, much more emphasis in an active citizenship on how the government works, on how citizens can become engaged, on what they can do, how they can advocate. And, and it is not surprising to see that sometimes, sometimes you see Quebec students being more activists. Well, they, that, they, that is taught at school. And when you compare with the curriculum here on, on PI, I, I looked at it with Carla once and I, it's just so small. The, 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 I guess the, the allocation of time and units to, to, to this activism, active citizenship aspect. And this is something that it could make a huge difference. We're always talking about how to get youth more engaged in politics. Well, sometimes it helps if the curriculum provides the basis or the tools to do that. Very fair point. Thank you, Maria. Um, now, Walter, I hope you won't mind if I uh, go over to uh, Heather Mullen uh, quickly, because I know she, she let me know she's gonna have to sign out to go pick up her son in just a few minutes and uh, just wanna, wanna hear what she has to say before she leaves. Heather? Hey, thanks. And I hope you can hear me okay. I'm sitting in a parking lot trying to catch the call. Um, me too clear. Okay, great. Um, so it's great to have these little chats and to get to know you in this way. Um, I'm currently the president of the PEI Home and School Federation. So I would mm -hmm. recommend taking a look at the work that the PEI Homeschool Federation has done over the years. And I'm happy to meet with you anytime, but what happens is every year we have parents from across PEI that, that write resolutions that, of issues they're seeing within their own school environment that they see as a need on a provincial level. And so every year we move those forward and we work on them. And I can tell you, if you go back through our book of resolutions and what's come forward over the last you know, five years, 10 years, there's still lots of items there that haven't been dealt with. You know, We talk about mental health, we talk about the need for for more counselors we talk about playgrounds we like all of these things um you have like the support is there the resolutions are there and we have a lot of information backing it so it's a, it's a wealth of information and i believe our new website went live yesterday so it's all still there but if you have any questions happy to meet with you go through some some of that on the bullying piece which of course we're all talking about this week i agree with bob's comment um i'm struggling um with the information because um, my daughter is LGBTQ and she faces this sort of stuff every day. A lot of students across PEI face this every day in every school. So it's not an East, just an East Wilshire thing. And I do feel badly that that school is being singled out because parents were able to speak up in the way that they did. It's important that we all know, but it's important that we know that it's happening everywhere it's all the time. And there's a lot of kids hurting. And sometimes it's hate and homophobic behavior or it's racism or it's bullying. And as I was thinking about it today, even more and talking with my daughter about it. We're, we're friends with a lady called Barbara Coloroso. And I would highly recommend um, if you anyone on the call has a minute to Google Barbara Colorosa and her TED talk or her talk on the bully, the bullied and the bystander. And it's a really fantastic understanding of the bullying circle. And it's an educational element that she's been here before. Again, like Bob said, we need to change the culture. And sometimes you need to change the culture by bringing in some of these theories and, and talking about them and getting more people on board. I know from my own daughter, she saw Barbara when she was probably nine, I don't know, she was pretty young. And I know that she has taken a role as an active participant in the, there's a whole circle and it defines all your roles when you're in these situations. And it's quite fascinating and the science behind bullying. And I just think that, you know, we do need to do more. It's not just in our schools that we need to do more in our communities. We need to do more in our homes. And so it's, it's all around, but it's, a, it is an important subject. And uh, COVID has shown us how difficult it is for everyone's mental health and well being. It's, it's the biggest topic that we're hearing about from parents across PEI. Anyhow, that's all I'm going to say. I'm happy. I'm going to keep listening for a bit before I have to go do my karate pickup. And please reach out anytime to talk further. Absolutely, I will. In fact, I was just meeting with Carla and, and Michelle Patterson earlier today, speaking about education and uh, the PEI Home and School 
a long list of recommendations and action uh, items. Uh, they were telling me how well they align with all the things I, I was saying I'd like to achieve and, and Carla and the Green Caucus in general, but uh, we are well aligned in putting the, the well-being of the children first, that's for certain. And I'd also, I'll, I'll comment on the, what b both Bob and yourself mentioned is not throwing the East Wiltshire under the bus. And I've mentioned the school a couple of times, but it, it's not that I think we need to deal with the issue at East Wiltshire. I think we need to deal with the systemic issues. The child and youth advocate said it well. There's, this was allowed to happen within a system. And that system is what needs to be, be adjusted here on Prince Edward Island. So no, it, it's not a school issue. In fact, I've spoken with a, a student at, at Elm Street on that same day, that same Thursday, a child in a black shirt came up to them and said, are you gay? No. Uh, do you uh, yeah. do, do you think that's okay kind of thing? And w was pressuring him to give him these kinds of answers. And that was at a different school within the same, within the system. So this, this is not East Wiltshire, no. And Peers Alliance is a great support to another group to, to connect with about their ongoing education and work in the community. So um, Peers Alliance can help and uh, do a lot there too. Very good, thank you, Heather. Um, I was gonna say, I just saw the comment, it's not just, I'd say it starts as early as elementary school. There's a lot of kids transitioning in elementary school and it goes right through. And the new guidelines are gonna be quite interesting if they get approved and go through for the need of additional education. So um, lots to talk about there. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll be in touch, Heather. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Heather. And uh, Walter, well, uh, thanks for letting Heather uh, go ahead there before she had to take off. Uh, would you like to uh, speak? And you're on mute right now. So if you just wanna unmute yourself. Oh, you're still on mute, Walter. There you yeah. are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks, Jordan, and nice to see and hear you, uh, Steve. Um, from, from my perspective, um, I've worked in the system for quite a while. I've been retired now for quite a while as well. I've taught in uh, three different provinces and administrated in three different provinces at, at various different levels. And so I have a wealth of experience, but at the end of it, I'm still as many questions as anyone else. I agree with Bob's statement that you've got to get in there and do a scratch and sniff and smell the dirty sneakers and get down and, and, and really talk to people. Um, that's where you're going to get your best impressions from. But having said that, I'm a policy wonk at heart. And so um, one of the things that has helped me, don't know if it'll help you, Steve, is to sort of have a conceptual differentiation between learning and education and public public schooling. Um, really, uh, by looking at it through sort of three different lenses that do converge, um, I was able to sort of navigate through the constellation of issues that, that you're going to find yourself in, in, in trying to um, come to grips with what all of this is about. Um, for me, um, by looking at public schooling, and I was able to teach uh, the history of public schooling at Dalhousie for a while, and so I got into some really interesting conversations uh, with people about uh, the history of public schooling, and I think if you can come to grips with that history, it doesn't hurt, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to understand that the fundamental um, uh, fundamental philosophy that public schooling was built on was one of assimilation and one of getting everyone to behave and act and think similar to everyone else. And we haven't abandoned that project in 2021. We're still, you know, deeply ingrained with that project. So it's of no surprise to me when you hear about people um, yearning for um, more discussion, more curriculum based discussion on differentiation uh, that it, it barely exists. You know, um, it was never the intent of public schooling to, um, to, to explore these things, but we've done it anyway. Sometimes teachers have done it in spite of curriculum, not because of it. And I think it is important to get, um, to wrap your head around curriculum and to see what the documents say. Uh, about curriculum um, and talk to teachers about the delivery of curriculum. Uh, there, there's a, a host of problems that reside there. My last job happened to be the uh, director of curriculum delivery. And um, I was able again to have deep conversations with both students and, and administrators and teachers about that. And there are a lot of problems that this venue doesn't 
given me the, the chance to talk about. But I do want to pivot on that one thing. If I was going to say a problem in the public schooling system that has to be attended to, it's the accountability. And I don't mean blame and shame accountability. I mean descriptive accountability on the curriculum that is actually being delivered to the students. Um, there is a lot of challenges for even lack of methodologies to, um, to, to really see, okay, we have this curriculum and in and of itself, there may be problems in that. There may be different content that you want to see in that, that's fine. But we have an existing curriculum and what we don't know, and there's barely any mechanism to find out is the degree to which that curriculum was actually being delivered to the students. And um, it's worthy of a much longer and deeper conversation. Uh, but I would say that is something that I would urge you to have um, more conversations with, um, with senior administrators, uh, teachers, and, and students too. Um, so we sit back as parents, I'm a parent too, grandparent, and we hope that the curriculum is being delivered. We almost presume it's being delivered, but I can tell you as an administrator, as a senior administrator, and as a teacher who often didn't deliver the prescribed curriculum, um, that, we, that it's, um, it's uh, wild and woolly out there. And so uh, we do need mechanisms to bring clarity to the degree to which the existing curriculum, even with its flaws, is being um, uh, comprehensively and consistently being delivered. Very fair points, Walter. You know, uh, curriculum delivery is, is part of what I'd like to focus on, Walter. And, and the reason it, it cues up in my head is I, I'm a tech head. Um, technology is, is usually where my mind goes to when I try to think of a solution to a problem. It's usually a technological solution that first pops into my head in any case. And I have a cousin that's a professor of psychology at the University of BC, um, PhD from Yale and all that stuff. Anyway, she did a study on curriculum delivery uh, and compared to curriculum delivered by device with curriculum delivered by teacher. And as you know, curriculum is not teaching. It's, it's just the curriculum aspect of things. So it's not a teacher replacement. It's a curriculum delivery mechanism. In any case, the iPad was every bit as effective at delivering curriculum as the teacher was. So what that made me think, and this is only an exploratory thing, Walter, is if we can use devices to free up the time of teachers so that they can do a better job of ensuring the children are learning more of a mentorship role, um, then, then that's gonna be a good thing for our system. And it just occurred to me now while you were speaking that it also creates the accountability because the device will know exactly where kids are within the curriculum. And it, if curriculum delivery is separate from a teacher, then well, what we have with all these kids being pushed through grade by grade together, regardless of whether they've completed the curriculum or not, this, it becomes much less of an issue because they can just work at the level they're at with the device they're at instead of a teacher having to deliver to an entire class at once. So a much more distributed system of curriculum delivery. So that's something I'm very interested in. Well, I just want a little one more comment then and I'll try to be quiet. And that is, uh, um, it, it would be interesting for you perhaps then to when you're talking, taking Bob's advice and talking to teachers, asking them what they think curriculum is. Hmm. Because you're going to get, you're going to get uh, a multitude of answers with respect to that too. And of course it does differentiate between, you know, pre-K and grade 12, but uh, even what curriculum looks like, you know, and what curriculum it is. It wasn't that long ago when I was talking to um, high school teachers, for example, and I asked them what curriculum was, they said, well, it's the textbook, you see. And, and, and so, and you're going to get other people with um, a much more comprehensive and, and, and a, a deeper understanding as to what curriculum is. But um, even that in and of itself, you know, I, you know, what curriculum looks like and what it's supposed to do and is an interesting question to engage with the teachers and students as well. That last part is very could important, I, could I Walter. Thing? Oh. Hey, could I, I would, uh, Oh, uh, Walter and I have never had this discussion before, hardly at all. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think it's really important to think of curriculum as it is. It's a tool, right? But uh, you want to wrap the curriculum around the kid you have, the child, rather than wrap the child around the curriculum. And the, the, I realize that sounds disgustingly, you know, simple. But uh, you teachers know the kids in front of them better than a uh, an iPad might. 
in terms of uh, what they can learn and what and what they're going to learn the best way for them to learn it. So there, I'll put a period there and stop. Sorry, sorry, Walter, couldn't help it. Well, this is a this is a really interesting uh, conversation. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, I'm just gonna before we go to Isaac. I actually had Susan signal me through the chat uh, earlier that she didn't have the hand and would like to get on the speaker's list. So I'll, I'll call you, Susan. Now. Thank you. I'm gonna turn my video off because I have rural internet. Um, I'm going to be really quick so that everyone else has a chance to do it, but I want to follow up on something Bob said and something Adina said and, and uh, everybody. Um, I had the opportunity to teach at the university an education class, and the first thing I did is I went to talk to Bob Gray about what teachers need to know. And I used um, a resource called The Third Path which it deals with both achievement and well-being. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but it can be both. So I'll send you that resource. Um, the other thing is, and Carla, again, what Bob said, you need to listen to Carla, which I'm glad you're doing. But she, in the legislature, challenged every MLA to take the brain story out of Alberta family wellness. And I would suggest that you do that and you encourage. I think it should be policy for every person dealing with a child in the education system to take brain story because it's about adverse childhood experiences, what it does to brain development, how children learn, what they need as Bob says from the, from the relationships that they have with teachers. Um, and the other resource, um, I think Dina mentioned, um, the emotional needs of kids. And I know, I believe Carl brought this up, but social emotional learning, I think needs to be an approach that the schools, I don't know if you can still hear me, use, yes, we can. Yes, we can. not just a curriculum that they teach kids, but a full, okay. Well, and there, I can't remember the name of the school, maybe Bob remembers, but there was a school in PEI that did a pilot using the social emotional approach um, and very successfully and if you want to prevent things like bullying if you want to make good civil citizens home, um, you need to look after the whole child so in the chat I've put uh, castle.org and you can look there and see a lot of the um, social emotional learning approaches and thirdly and 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 this is something that Toby has been talking about a lot and that is the freedom for teachers and employees to speak up um, in, and not fear losing their jobs. So that's the other thing that I'd, I'd like some focus on. Anyway, I'll put those things in the, in the ideas board as well. Okay, and I've been taking a lot of notes too, so you can go in there and fix up anything that I might've misrecorded there, Susan. Okay, um, and I'll get to Isaac now. Uh, would you like to share? Yeah, sure. Uh, first off, Jordan and Steve, thank you very much for doing this. This is absolutely wonderful. And I'm glad that I got here in enough time to be able to check it out. Um, I just wanted to go back. I, I know I'm sure that I missed a bit. I jumped in at about 10 after seven, so I may have missed a little bit. So excuse me if I'm already addressing something that's already, I'm addressing something that's already been approached. Uh, Steve, when you were mentioning about incorporating the Indigenous history into the curriculum and really taking that by the bullhorns, um, and taking uh, and you know actually having it in the curriculum, which is great. Um, I just want to make sure that the right communities are talked to as the experts. Not necessarily. I'm not excluding anybody, but I just want to make sure that the right people are approached, and not necessarily just um, curriculum consultants. But talk oh, to absolutely. communities. Oh, talk oh, to I the did. elders. Talk to yeah. everybody yes. that you can think of as that can you know provide the right input. That, um, that's right, Isaac, and, and that process has just begun. So yeah, we well, haven't absolutely. had it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, sure I, I'm sure that you're already there and already thinking about all that stuff. I just want to put words to the thought. Um, <clears throat> I'm, a really, if, I'm a relatively new teacher to the system, um, but the little that I had, uh, but I've been around teachers and the education system for a while, in and out as 
a substitute teacher and a short-term contract teacher. Um, and something that I've, that I've come across just in the last couple of, couple of weeks and really had a chance to talk to um, people in that position about is the real lack of um, educational assistance in the schools. So within the last week, there's upwards of over 70 posts and jobs available. And from the educational assistants that I've talked to, there, <clears throat> what ended up what it ended up coming down to is, if there is only there is only maybe seventy substitutes available province wide, and if they're adding more jobs, those substitutes are substitutes substitute EAs are going to take those jobs and. There goes the list of substitutes for those um, situations, mm -hmm. for those educational assistants, um, youth study workers as well. Um, so what I'm kind of thinking of is if there's a possibility of creating some sort of pilot project similar to the substitute teacher pilot project that's already on the go that just was introduced in September um, or some extra incentives or a way of increasing training to make it more accessible um, so that the educational assistants receive um, the support that they need and we can get some more educational assistance with the training, with the appropriate training into the system so that um, education, the EAs themselves don't have to um, worry about if they take a sick day, will there, will there be someone there to support the child? I mean, this is going right exactly with it. It's right there with what Adina was saying before. And I'm thinking specifically about the elementary school and kindergarten students. Um, I was a part of a conversation today with an educational assistant who was taking care of a child all day. And this educational assistant was on, a, on the verge of a, um, of a breakdown because she, there is very, um, this particular child is going through some changes to the routine and their own supports at home. And the educational assistant spent the whole day with them and it was a very trying day. Um, and it's because of the, you know, we're in a situation where educational assistants are really lacking. The numbers itself are really lacking. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a way that we can create some sort of, again, pilot project, similar to the substitute list that, uh, substitute pilot project that was introduced in September for some sort of stable work for educational assistance, so that they're offering a full-time job, but they're going from school to school to school, whatever they're whatever's needed. Um, so I was just again. Um, so that would be instead it, of a substitute teacher list. Is that? Well, I mean, still in uh, in addition to the substitute teacher list, but off as opposed to just a substitute teacher list that is where those substitute. EAs don't necessarily know they'll have a job tomorrow or somewhere to go and work, hire, have them be hired full time, and then they'll be able to go. So it creates an economic security situation where they know that they have a job and they're able to go um, and fill posts wherever on the island, as opposed to going to bed, not knowing if they're going to have a job somewhere. It might create some incentive for more more people to receive the EA training or the increase the pool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, and yeah, I, I could not agree more with what Walter and Bob were both saying um, concerning the curriculum. And I really appreciate the fact that Bob mentioned that the um, approach of students first, that the curriculum is to meet the student, not the student meeting the curriculum. So we modify the curriculum to the student meet the students where they are. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll, I was just meant, thinking about this when Susan was talking, there is someone that's part of the Department of Education uh, <clears throat> department up at Memorial University that wrote this great book about relationships first when it comes to the educational system. Um, I believe if I'm not mistaken, it's called, it's in fact called Relationships First and it, talk, it discusses different approaches as to um, the right support for 
students in relationship to the curriculum. Anyway, I can't think of the resource off the top of my head, but I'll see if I can send it along so that you have an idea of what it looks like if you're interested. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it for me. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, so yeah, we've got uh, just a few minutes left and I see that Adina's hand uh, is up. Uh, yes, but I could talk all day long about education. <laughs> of course. <laughs> there, there's so many things that I wanna say. So first of all, uh, the Alberta and Wellness Brain Story that Susan mentioned, it is absolutely amazing. I really think that you should take a look at it. Um, another thing I wanted to say is you're talking about um, Indigenous studies, and at first you mentioned Mi'kmaq studies, and as much as I believe that's very important based on the fact that we are on PEI, we have to remember that not necessarily all Indigenous children on PEI are going to be Mi'kmaq, so it is very important to also learn a little bit more globally about it. Um, one thing that I would love to suggest, and it would be amazing if it could get into the high schools is the 20 things you may not know about the Indian Act. That book is an amazing read. And then if you go to the end of the book, it even tells you how to teach it to children. It, it, it tells you how to do everything. It has questions to make them think, it has resources. It, it's just amazing. Um, and then you had mentioned the need for retaining early childhood educators. And yes, you had mentioned the wage, which is a big issue for sure. But Brad Trivers had promised pay parity within the next four years, a year ago. So there's keeping that in mind and also keeping the government accountable for the pay parity with educational assistance that the early childhood educators level three certified are expecting is making sure that happens. But one of the big things that we keep forgetting is it's not only about pay. So right now, Essentially, I have my educators, they're on the floor for seven and a half hours a day with the children. They get 30 minutes breaks. In that seven and a half hours, they're with, uh, depending on the age group, like infants are three, but toddlers, then you get five to 10 kids, right? Um, and then within this, you, the government expects for us to plan what we're going to offer every day have our materials ready, to have uh, learning stories about every child done almost every day, to have meet meetings with every parent of every child twice a year, and so much more, but we don't have one second of paid time for that. That is all overtime, that there are so many who take it home and do it on their personal time, and I know teachers do the same, but at a certain point, I think there needs to be recognition that the government requires us to do all these things and gives us zero time to do it. You have to be on the floor with the children from the start of your shift to the end of the shift. They refuse to give paid planning time to early childhood educators. And let's face it, any education job in, at any age, it's very, very, very demanding. And here, they don't even get a break. They barely get Wow. Thank you uh, for sharing that, Adina. Did uh, anybody else have anything? Uh, oh, I see Walter, uh, you've got your hand up again there. Yeah, I, I don't want to leave this meeting with a, with a negative note. Um, but, I, but I'm probably going to anyways. The, uh, like Bob and a number of other people have been sitting around here talking, uh, we've met miracle workers in, in, in the classrooms. You know, we've met teachers that are just the beyond anything that I could hope to ever be in the classroom. And uh, that's not the negative part. The negative part is that we also have idiots teaching our children. And um, there are no mechanisms in place to adequately deal with those um, unfortunate outliers that, that, that you know, we try to, and as, and as teachers and, and administrators, Bob and I have, have wrestled with this issue, I'm sure, you know, is that, um, is that the mechanism to deal with problematic teachers and some of them, I, I've known teachers that were wonderful for 10 years, 
total crap and, and, and disrupted for three and then gone back to wonderful. I, I, I don't want to um, characterize this as a, as a simple issue, but uh, to be reductionist on it, the, the lack of mechanism to deal specifically, quickly, effectively with teachers who are not uh, doing the job that parents or students or administrators want is, is a real issue. And um, that's a sensitive issue because even to talk like this, I, I feel awkward about it. Um, but it, it, but, it, but as, as long as we keep a blind eye to, to, to um, moments of incompetency or even uh, whole careers of incompetency, um, we're, we're going to be doing a lot of our children uh, injustices. So uh, that's a heavy one, Steve, but- uh, uh, It is good. Walter, but you're not the only person that said it to me. Not the only teacher but I'm not even sure where to start to tackle that, Walter. I believe, uh, I as, as presented to me by the other person who's had this conversation with me, uh, it may be a union issue um, in, in just, they can't get rid of anybody that's not doing their job well because the union protects them. And I don't know if that's something that I can tackle. I uh, it goes. Know. I'm not sure if you hear, but it goes beyond that too. And if you want to sit down and hear my two cents worth on it, uh, certainly I do. If there are mechanisms in place in other provinces that we could adopt if we wanted to, um, you know, and there are simple uh, human resource things that we could do as well. Um, but uh, yeah, anyways, it's just an issue I didn't want to uh, be silent on. It's a beast of an issue. Okay. Thank you uh, for, for bringing that up too. So this has been a really great conversation. We're just uh, just past the hour here. And I've got, man, I don't even know how many notes, but it's, I've got a lot of notes up on our board. We didn't even get into post-secondary <laughs> education <laughs> in this discussion. There's so much to talk about just in early childhood and, and, uh, and school system. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for such a great conversation, everyone. Uh, remember, I'll, I'll follow up with everybody with a, um, uh, you know, with, with this link to this board and, and Steve's email address so that you can, you know, continue to send him your Please ideas do. and uh, resources and things like that. And um, remember that uh, this is only the second of eight sessions like this that we're going to be having. So there's lots more good conversations to be had uh, next week. Um, or actually, sorry, first of all, on this Thursday, we are going to be joined by Ola Hammerland, and he is taking on the transp transportation and infrastructure portfolio. So those are uh, some pretty important ones as far as our uh, climate change commitments, obviously, uh, transportation and, and then the buildings that government's building here, two, two big, big areas. And, uh, and then next week on uh, Thursday, we're going to be joined by Hannah Bell. Hannah has taken on a couple of different uh, portfolios, uh, including um, environment, energy, and climate change. So they've rejigged that. It used to be environment, water, and climate change, and now it's environment, energy, and climate change. And um, she's also the finance critic. So there will be lots to talk about there as well. So you can find the, the details and, and the links to register on our website. Just uh, click on our events tab there. And uh, you'll, find, you'll find the details of, of those and other upcoming events. Uh, we'll also send those out by email to everybody who registered today. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Steve. We'll uh, Ooh, let you get back to playing with your kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jordan got to see uh, one hanging off my head just before you guys all joined here. <laughs> yeah, I told him, keep, wear <laughs> keep wearing that kid. It's a good look on you. <laughs> all right. Good night, guys. Okay, good night everyone.